Hey guys, this is Oakley. Go ahead and watch the Hannibal trailer if you haven't already. If you have, go ahead and rewatch it just to get you in the mood, and then I'll get back to you afterwards with some historical context. We should have destroyed Carthage. Every man, woman, and child. Many years ago. Saguntum is lost, and our Western allies have failed us. Where was the last report of his whereabouts? My spies in Iberia tell me his fleet has sailed. We must expect an invasion at Massalia! Nonsense! No fleet has sailed. Rome controls the Mediterranean. He's not attacking, he's making allies. At this very moment, he courts the Macedonians, the Greeks! Illyria will rise up against us, and the Adriatic will be lost once more. Ridiculous! Emperors won't stand for it. Our legions have sole military access to their land. I believe the attack will come from Africa itself. He intends to cross the Mediterranean and invade from Sicily. Syracuse will revolt and sweep up from the south. That's why I should be We cannot He will come not from the south, nor the east. Mercenaries in the north report that he has forged an alliance with the tribes of the Po Valley. He intends to circumnavigate Massalia and march his Over army... Over the Alps, perhaps! <laughs> he would lose half his army from attrition alone. The other half would deserve... We must it. defend the mountain passes! Do you expect the Gauls to welcome him when he arrives? I suppose he will bring with him an army of elephants! I dare say that would be quite a feat. Even for the great Hannibal Barker. So, of course, when we're talking about this war with Hannibal, this is going to be the second Punic War, the second of three Punic Wars between Rome and Carthage. Rome, of course, in Italy, Carthage settled um, basically with its base in North Africa. In any case, the second Punic War took place in 218 BC and went on until 201 BC. So it's interesting in terms of the, paral the parallels we can see between the Punic Wars and the, the World Wars in later European history. We can think of Carthage as Germany after the first uh, of these wars. So in essence, both powers lost, and after the first war, they had to pay huge reparations to the victors. So in any case, that meant that Carthage had to pay huge war reparations to Rome on a yearly basis, pounds and pounds of gold and silver to the Romans. Uh, it was a, a humiliating form of uh, to uh, to this basically this huge mercantilistic uh, society that had to pay uh, annually, you know, this this treasury that they had earned to the Romans in a very humiliating contract. So what did they do? The Carthaginians, in response, basically went at it as they were used to. They upped the ante when it came to their agriculture at home. They revamped some of their trade. And most importantly, what they did is they started to expand abroad. Now, that means most importantly, um, their holdings in Spain. So Spain had long been sort of a, a one of the provinces that Carthage was interested in. It had some holdings there. But under Hamilcar Barca in 238, he led an army into Spain and aggressively started taking over uh, the territory. So Hamilcar, Bar Hamilcar Barca, I should say, was uh, basically one of the members of the Barca clan, and they were more known for their, their generals and their more aggressive foreign policies. So Hamilcar Barca, as I said, goes into Spain and he starts trying to take over the region. And the region of Spain was well known for its uh, natural resources, so Carthage was able to extract huge amounts of silver from there, and it used it to repay Rome and uh, sort of strengthen its armies and its uh, essentially its nation again and revive it. So, 
Rome, who is uh, in the interim between the wars, uh, embroiled in some other conflicts. Rome is busy with the Illyrian conflicts uh, in northern Cisalpine Italy, basically in the Alps. What you see is Roman colonists. Uh, so Rome was sending colonists up there to make, uh, you know, tame the land and sort of expand northwards. That aggravated the barbarians and the tribes up there, so they revolted. So Rome had to deal with those two fronts. Uh, in any case, as Carthage was expanded, Rome was uh, somewhat concerned. So um, you have Hamilcar who's expanding, but he is killed in 229 at the hands of one of the tribes uh, in an ambush. His son-in-law Hasdrubal uh, takes power, and Hasdrubal signs an agreement with Rome saying that the river Ebro, this, uh, this river is in northern Spain, basically saying that uh, Carthage will not expand there. And at the time when he had signed that treaty, uh, the Carthaginian holdings were well to the south of that, and um, that seemed like a, ba a, fa a fair bet, essentially, you could say. Anyways, Hasdrubal makes good process. He uh, starts taking over more and more of Spain. He marries a Spanish princess, and he makes much, much progress until he's assassinated in 221. Um, and upon his death, Hannibal, the Hannibal we know, is elected uh, at the age of 26 to overall command of the Carthaginian armies in Spain. So what happens then is Rome, as I said, is occupied with these other nations and problems. It signs the Treaty of Ebro, and um, basically things are left as, uh, as they are. Um, but what happens then is there is a revolt, basically an uprising in um, right off the coast of Italy to the west in Corsica. So that was originally Carthaginian holdings, but there was problems with mercenaries there. And in essence, there was an uprising. And what happens is Rome takes advantage of the situation, allies with one of the, the groups involved in this sort of civil unrest, and essentially comes in and swoops in and takes over the entire island, essentially annexing what was Carthaginian territory. Now in response, Carthage is of course outraged, but it can't do anything, otherwise it would risk war with Rome. So this is something that is outrageous in terms of the politics and the honor of the Romans. Uh, you know, even Roman historians have a hard time excusing the act, and it, it angers a lot of people, particularly what would be Hamilcar Barca and uh, this, this his son Hannibal. And uh, Hamilcar has a strong hatred of Rome because of this humiliating, you know, payment that it has to make to Rome, in addition to its seizure of uh, Corsica and the islands of, uh, of Sardinia. And so that's just unacceptable. And uh, he swears his son that he will, uh, he may, he binds him in an oath to say that he will never rest until he brings Rome to her knees. So that's essentially the, the legend behind Hannibal. So in any case, Carthage is humiliated. So Carthage basically finds solace in its expansions in Spain. Now, as I said before, they had signed the treaty with Rome, basically saying that uh, they would not cross the river Ebro. But what happens is the city of Saguntum. Saguntum is a city, or I should say maybe a village, that's a mile off of the coast. Now, it's unclear um, essentially what uh, its ties were to Rome, but there are two competing theories. The first says that uh, because of trade, Saguntum had allied itself, or at least become a partner with mercantile Rome. Another one says that seeing Carthaginian expansion in the Italian sort of uh, territories, Saguntum sought for uh, assistance from Rome. In any case, as Carthage expands, Rome has an alliance with Saguntum. Now this puts sort of Rome uh, well past its means. Carthage sees this as an intrusion on multiple fronts. So not only was it against the Ebro Treaty in the sense that Carthage was, according to this treaty, allowed free reign anything south of the Ebro River, which uh, Saguntum was included. Now also Carthage was outraged because it was again another sort of treacherous move by the Romans who had taken their islands from Carthage unwarranted and were now, you know, basically bullying Carthage. So what happens is Hannibal is having none of it. He uh, he involves himself in a local quarrel, basically between a couple tribes in the region. One of them is allied to Carthage. Hannibal supports them and lays siege to Saguntum. He lays siege for eight months, and eventually the city falls in 219. Hannibal rejoices. He takes the spoils of the city back to New Carthage, takes his troops back, and they rest. Now Hannibal starts to plan. In the meantime, Rome objects, but as I said, has other priorities to deal with. It has the Illyrian Wars, the revolts to the north, and also it isn't quite ready to deal with Carthage. The consuls are currently abroad, and they can't really deal with Rome, uh, with Carthage. I should say. I should say. So what happens is Rome waits. They can't help the uh, Saguntum under siege, and they just sit there and deal with their own internal problems. 
Now what happens next is after the fall of Saguntum, Rome is outraged. Um, and so what it does is it sends uh, an embassy over to Carthage demanding that Hannibal and his officers responsible for this be sent to Rome as prisoners. So this uh, embassy is led by uh, Quintus Fabius Maximus, who will be you know, a well-known name for those of you who know of the Second Punic War. He would be known as Maximus the Delayer because of his effective tactics in sort of uh, kiting against Hannibal. In any case, he is leading the party, and with him come Lucius Aemilianus Paulus and Marcus Livius Salinator. They are both the sort of exiting consuls for the year. So in any case, they go to Carthage and they make these huge demands, demanding that Carthage step down and hand over their generals, uh, and in response, Carthage is outraged for the reasons I noted because of Rome's sort of treacherous political past. So what happens is there starts to be shouting. And uh, according to the stories, Maximus comes out and stands in front of the congregation and he says that I carry in the folds of my toga both peace and war and let fall from it whatever the Carthaginians choose. Outrage ensues, and there's shouting. Uh, Ma then Fabius Maximus responds by declaring that he will let fall war. And in response, the, Carthag the Carthaginians shout, we accept it. And so in this uproar, the Second Punic War is commenced. Now, Hannibal was not sitting idly while he had retreated to New Carthage. He basically knew that something was going to happen, and as a sworn enemy of Rome, he was preparing. So what he does is he puts... Um, a plan into effect. He's been amassing supplies. He sends down large forces into northern Africa to secure essentially the homeland and he leaves forces in Spain in order to secure his holdings there and then he starts amassing armies and marches to the north. So he leaves New Carthage in 218 and starts heading across the Ebro moving at a rapid pace. The Romans see this and they begin to formulate their own plans for the war. Now after the First Punic War, Rome had essentially undisputed control of the seas with the use of their corvus, and so they're not necessarily controlled with a uh, uh, concern, I should say, with an invasion by sea. So what they start to do is think about the offensive, and what they go ahead and do is they send one of the consuls, uh, Scipio, down to Sicily to start preparing an army for invasion of North Africa. In the meantime, they start mustering legions to the north, two, three legions legions start forming in the north and what happens is Hannibal is rapidly advancing. Scipio is then chosen and this is Publius Scipio. There are several Scipios in the family. Anyways, Publio Scipio is to lead an army and he is to go to Spain and basically take on Hannibal there well away from Italy. And so he makes his way and he docks in Massilia. Now once he's there, his scouts report that Hannibal has left the Ebro. Now this is the latest news that Rome has heard and they have no idea where Hannibal is going. As you saw in the trailer, there was a lot of confusion. So in any case, what he does, what Scipio does is he sends out a reconnaissance party. They essentially bump into Hannibal's own scouts. A skirmish ensues. The Roman scouts pursue pursue Hannibal's forces back to Hannibal's camp. They discover him, this huge force that's moving towards Italy. So what the scouts do is they report this back to Scipio. Scipio rallies his troops and he's seeking an outright engagement, but by the time he gets to Hannibal's camp, Hannibal has left, left and it's been three days. He's heading to the northeast over to the Alps. So what Scipio does as he decides to send uh, another Scipio, Gnaeus Scipio, to continue on with the army over to Spain, fight the war there, take on uh, the Barkid holdings. Meanwhile, Publius Scipio is going to head over east and join the legions that are mustering to the north of Italy, and he's going to try and oppose Hannibal there. Now, in any case, we join Hannibal, who's marching with his supply train all throughout the Alps. He's recruiting the help of basically the barbarians in the region, either bribing them to allow passage or recruiting some of them uh, with, uh, you know, promises of, of exploits and, uh, you know, all the gold that they can get in uh, essentially assaulting northern Italy. So in any case, Hannibal does have a hard time going with the attrition with some tribes that take advantage of his passing, but Hannibal comes out victorious. Finally, he crosses the Alps with 20,000 infantry and 6,000 cavalry. To the great surprise of the Romans and all involved, he emerges, springs into Italy when no one expects it, no one is ready, and he engages in outright war. He rests his troops, he starts recruiting from the Gauls and all the tribesmen to the north who are otherwise disenchanted with Roman rule and are willing to seek revenge. So Hannibal starts mustering his forces and he starts pillaging the countryside. Now Romans are taken aback by this. They don't know what to do. And they engage in a series of battles where they are ultimately going to lose. 
Hannibal goes on, and this is where I'm going to leave you to capture essentially most of Italy, turn Rome's allies against her, and he goes on to be undefeated when it comes to battles on the Italian peninsula. But that's where I'm going to leave you guys. There'll be more history next time. I hope you enjoy. See you guys next time.